Hello everyone, my name is Natalie Hogg. I'm a cosmologist here at the IFT, and today I'm going to be answering the question, what is a standard siren and why are they interesting for cosmology? So before we get into that question, we need to understand a very important discovery which was made in the 1920s, which is that the universe is expanding. So how was this discovery made? Observations of distant galaxies were made, so galaxies outside our own Milky Way. So I'm going to draw us as the observer here, and some distant galaxy. And the wavelength of the light from these galaxies was observed. But what, it was, what was noticed by the astronomers at the time, including Edwin Hubble, the most famous of these, was that the further away a galaxy is, the longer the wavelength of the light that we see. So this wavelength here is much longer than the first wavelength. So this is a more distant galaxy than this one. And what they realise from this affects the stretching of the wavelength of light, which causes the galaxy to look redder than ones which are closer, is that these galaxies must be travelling away from us with a certain speed or velocity, v. And this effect, which is called redshift, you can also observe it in sound waves. So for example, if you imagine a police car which is travelling past you very fast with its siren going, you can hear the change in the pitch of the sound as it passes you because the sound waves are being stretched or compressed. So the same thing happens with light. So from this realisation that more distant galaxies were travelling away from us, Edwin Hubble constructed what's known as Hubble's Law, which says that the recession velocity of a galaxy, v, is equal to its distance away from us, d, multiplied by a constant h naught or h zero, naught being an old-fashioned word for zero. This quantity is very, very interesting in cosmology because it encapsulates the expansion rate of the universe. So I'll just write down. And we're really interested in trying to measure this quantity in cosmology because if we learn about the expansion rate of the universe, that tells us a lot about its composition. So for example, how much matter is there? And very, very interestingly, how much dark energy is there? So dark energy is a substance which we believe is acting on the universe at late times, so nowadays, which is causing this expansion to speed up all the time, to accelerate. So it's overcoming the force of gravity and causing our universe to expand ever faster and faster. And we can learn all about this expansion rate through measuring this parameter h naught. So in other words, we would like to measure the recession velocity of certain objects, which we do through their redshift, and also their distance from us. With these two quantities, we're able to measure h naught. That's fine, but there's many, many different ways we can use to measure h naught, and I'll discuss one of those in a moment. But the problem is that all of these different measurements don't agree. And in fact, they disagree so severely that it's not just down to random chance, we really think there's a statistically significant tension between these different measurements. And there's some speculation as to where this tension comes from. Perhaps it could be just a systematic effect. In other words, some of our measurements uh, are just, there's some error, we're not doing the measurement correctly. But a more interesting theory is that this tension in the different uh, measurements of H0 is a physical effect. So it's some new undiscovered physics which is causing this discrepancy. So making as many measurements of h naught as we can is really important to try and understand exactly what this tension is being caused by. So let me now describe one particular way that we measure h naught through a technique called standard candles. So the word standard here is key, and this will come back when I talk about standard sirens in a moment. The word standard really means that we're able to measure this distance accurately. We're able to basically know how far away the particular object is. And the word candle here, well, this is referring to the fact that we use a particularly bright object to do this measurement. And in this case, we use something called a Type 1a supernova. So why are these special? So a supernova is the explosion of a star at the end of its lifetime. So the star, if it's particularly massive, eventually it will use up all of its fuel, so the hydrogen and helium inside it, and so the radiation pressure, which pushes outwards due to the fusion reaction, will weaken. And the gravitational attraction caused by the mass of the star itself will overcome this weakening radiation pressure. So the star essentially collapses in on itself and then explodes outwards. And that's a supernova explosion. But for a Type 1a supernova, this is the particular formation mechanism they have. 
This explosion always occurs at the same mass, and this is key, because if it occurs with the same mass, it will have the same brightness every time it explodes, no matter where they are in the universe. So this is where the word candle comes in. You can imagine if you had a candle here close by to you, and you knew the brightness of this candle, and then there was another candle very, very far away, which obviously would look dimmer, you could simply work out how far away it was if you know the relationship between the two brightnesses. And this is exactly what we do with type 1a supernovae in the universe. So if we, we can standardize their brightness and therefore their distance, so we can measure the distance here. And as for the redshift, that's relatively easy. We can get this by simply identifying the galaxy in which this supernova is, and there's methods of getting redshifts of individual galaxies. So this is how we measure H0 using this standard candle method. So what about standard sirens? Now this is a bit different. So at the end of a star's lifetime, as I said, you can have this supernova explosion. But what's left behind is also very interesting. So again, depending on the initial mass of the star which is undergoing this explosion, you can form something called a neutron star as the remnant of the explosion. So this is a star which is made almost purely of neutrons, so these are the neutral particles that you find in the centre of atoms. They're typically paired with a proton, which is a positively charged particle, with the electrons, the negatively charged particles around them. And these neutron stars, which are essentially the leftover core of the, the star, they're very, very hot, they're radiating, they have a very high spin, and they also have very strong magnetic fields. So you can picture the neutron star as something like this. The magnetic fields cause very large jets of radiation to be emitted into the universe. And this means that if this star is spinning around very quickly and emitting these long jets, they flash essentially like a lighthouse. But how about the standardization of these? How can we tell how far away this thing is? These neutron stars can be different masses, they can have different spins, they can have different brightnesses, so it's not so easy as in the case of these type 1a supernova to standardize the brightness. Luckily, these neutron stars often form in binaries, so a pair of neutron stars together. And so we can imagine that over time, we can form lots of these binary neutron star systems, where you have two neutron stars which are orbiting around each other, in exactly the same way as the Earth orbits the Sun, for example. But these orbits can become unstable and decay, and essentially what happens is the two neutron stars are orbiting around each other until eventually they, the orbits spin up, they merge together in another huge explosion, and emit a lot of light, and interestingly, a second signal. They also emit something called gravitational waves. So to understand what a gravitational wave is, we have to talk a little bit about general relativity, which is our current best theory of how gravity works. And in general relativity, we have, instead of having space and time as two separate entities, we simply have space and time combined together into one thing, which we call space-time. And space-time isn't static, it's dynamical, it reacts to things, and in particular it reacts to masses. Now neutron stars are very dense objects, and so when you have two of them orbiting around each other and merging, this causes a lot of disturbance in space-time. And in particular, the emission of gravitational waves. So to picture what's happening, if you think of a very, very still pond or puddle, and you drop a stone into the centre, you'll basically see a lot of ripples emanating out from where that stone lands in the water. And this is the, how we can think of how gravitational waves propagate through space-time. Now, they're not particularly strong, you can't feel them with your body, but we can detect them in very, very sensitive detectors that we have on Earth. So we can imagine we've got these two neutron stars merging together, and they're going to emit some gravitational waves. Obviously, this is not to scale, <laughs> and then they're going to arrive in our detector here on Earth. We currently have three gravitational wave detectors, two of them part of the LIGO collaboration, which is in the United States, and the third one is part of the Virgo collaboration, which is European, and that's based in Italy. And they all have this same design. They're two arms in an L shape, and each of the arms is around about four kilometers long. So what's going on inside these detectors? So we have a detector here, and a mirror at this end. And a laser is shining light down one of the arms, it gets reflected from the mirror, and arrives back at the detector here. We know the speed of light, we know how long these arms should be, 
So we can just time the length of time it takes for the laser light to go to one end, reflect off the mirror, and come back again. But what happens when a gravitational wave passes? Well, what it does to these detectors is causes them to oscillate backwards and forwards very slightly. So each arm of the detector essentially grows and shrinks as the gravitational wave passes through. And because we have this very sensitive laser shining through there, we can work out essentially the change in the distance and the change in the length of the arm caused by the gravitational wave, and so its strength. And this produces something which we call the waveform, a pattern which over time looks a bit like this. So you have the signal being very regular as the two objects are orbiting around each other. And then at the moment of merger, this signal becomes very, very violent. Until then, it tails off again. By measuring the amplitude of this strain, so how powerful this is, we can work out the distance because this strain, h of t, is inversely proportional to that distance. And how about getting the redshift? Well, it's the same as in the case of the standard candles. We're simply able to, because the fact that these neutron stars emit light as well as gravitational waves, we can see where it happened in the sky and identify the galaxy that these neutron stars are inside. And again, we have many, many what's called spectroscopic surveys of galaxies, which are dedicated just to measuring the redshift of individual galaxies. So we have the light, we have the gravitational waves, so we have the redshift, we have the distance, and consequently we can measure h naught from these standard sirens, which, as I said, is the aim of the game, to measure this expansion rate. So we've only measured one of these events ever so far, and that was called GW170817, a very catchy name, it's named after the date that it was discovered on. And so consequently, we don't have a particularly good measurement of h naught yet, from this standard siren technique, because with just one, there's a lot of uncertainty about how this, about the waveform, the shape, and this conversion to the distance. So it has very big error bars. So at the moment, the standard sirens can't say much about the H0 tension, but we're hopeful in the future, because more detectors are being constructed, that we'll basically be able to see more events and improve our uh, constraints. So that's the main reason why standard sirens are interesting for cosmology. There's actually a second one. So a big question in cosmology is, uh, is general relativity really the correct description of gravity? And many people think there are problems with general relativity and try to come up with alternative models and alternative theories. And in many, many of these theories, people believe that the speed of gravity is different to the speed of light. So we had this question, is the speed of light the same as the speed of gravity? And if the answer is yes, then this is a big win for general relativity. If you can uh, think back to what's going on here, we have light being emitted, and we have gravitational waves being emitted from the same object and traveling the same distance to us here on Earth. So we're able to determine if the speed of gravity is the same as the speed of light. And well, the answer is yes, they are the same to roughly one part in 10 to the 15. So that's 10 with 15 zeros after it. So they're virtually identical. So this was really, really important just from that one single event, GW170817, this question was able to be answered. So this was another excellent demonstration of the validity of general relativity. So in summary, we have, we've understood what a standard siren is. It's when two neutron stars merge together and we observe both the light and the gravitational wave signal from them. And they're really important and interesting in cosmology because we want to try and measure this quantity h naught, which tells us about the expansion rate, the contents and the behavior of the universe. And the standard sirens can do this because we are able to get the distance from the gravitational waves and the redshift from the light itself. So that's it.